1 Corinthians 1, 11 through 13. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or, or, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? If you remember last week, we talked about uh, that Chloe's people verse. We talked about how we as have a tendency as human beings to want to be divisive. We have a tendency as human beings to want to look down on people. We have a tendency as human beings to be passive aggressive and, and to feel superior and, and to, to believe that, that everything we know and think is better than someone else. I, I get frustrated. Here's a pet peeve of mine. Y'all love my pet peeves, right? Praise God. Uh, I get frustrated when people, I, I used to argue a lot right? Used to, I love to argue. Like, I love to debate. I love to get into it. I, I like to dispute facts and all this stuff. And people used to get mad at me, and they would say, Christian, your problem is you always think that you're right. And I would get so frustrated about that because, of course, I think I'm right. Everybody thinks they're right. If I didn't think I was right, I would change the way in which I thought. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. But what I realize now, as a more mature adult, what they were saying is that you can't open your mind to understand that it's possible that you're wrong. And that's what we have to learn to do as Christians, because we're not perfect. We're not Jesus. We, we're, we don't have complete understanding. And we've got to learn, man, people believe different things, and it's possible that they're right and that I'm wrong. Yes, I think that I'm right. Of course, I think that I'm right, but I need to open up my mind to be able to say, you know what, it's okay if I'm not right. And then take that a step further and say, even though I think I'm right and I think they're wrong, it's okay that they're wrong, right? So what if someone's bad at algebra? It doesn't mean we think less of them, but all of a sudden, it, if someone's bad at politics, we think less of them, it doesn't make any sense. So that's what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to talk about it on a more broad scale. We talked about division amongst us as human beings, as persons, as Christians, and how it's not glorifying to God, how God wants us to be united, how the world will know us because of our love for one another, and how we need to start demonstrating that as Christians. This week, we're talking about something completely different. I'm going to read again, verse 12 and 13. What I mean is that each of one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Today, church, what I want to talk about is denominations. I want to talk about denominations. Y'all know what denominations are? Your Baptists, your Pentecostals, Assemblies of God, Church of God, uh, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans. These are all denominations. And, and because I, I really think what Paul is calling out is a very early form of denominationalism. And I'll, let me just, before we even get into it, I just want to tell you what I think is going on here and, and what the broader picture is for us as a church. I'm just going to call it like it is. I believe that dom denominationalism is used as a way to divide churches, to segregate churches, to, to separate theologies, and, and, and to, to keep believers apart, ununited, in a very nonsens nonsensical, ungodly, unbiblical way. That's what I believe about denominations and how they can be used. That being said, I want to slow down a little bit. That being said, I'm not saying that denominations are bad. I don't believe that Paul in 1 Corinthians is saying that denominations are bad. I believe that denominations as organizations can be very fruitful. They can be very beneficial. I was, I was ordained in the Southern Baptist Convention. I, I, my ordination is a denominational ordination. Um, I've seen denominations do great things for churches. Denominations build churches. They buy chairs. They pay salaries for new pastors. They send out missionaries. They do great things for the kingdom of God. So please hear me when, I, when I'm saying that I am not attacking denominations. Y'all following me? You hear me? All right, now that I said that, let me attack some denominations, all right? We good? Let me read again what Paul says. Each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. 
Remember that Paul here is talking to Christians. He's talking to a church that he planted. He's talking to fellow believers. Y'all know what the word Christian means? Anyone? Christ follower. Perfect. Christ like is close. It means follower of Christ. I know because it's my name. I googled it, right? <laughs> right? Christian means follower of Christ, right? So when someone asks you, who do you follow? All of our answers should be the same. It should be Christ, right? It's not, I follow Christian at Christian Life Church. It's not, I follow Joseph Prince and his ministries. It's, it's not, I follow uh, Martin Luther. It's not, I follow uh, John Wesley. It's, I follow Christ. Yet, there's division amongst the church. There's division because people who go to the same church are being divisive amongst who they follow. Some are saying, I follow Apollos. Others are saying, I follow Cephas. If you don't know, Cephas is another name for Peter, for St. Peter. Um, these are all pastors. These are all preachers and teachers. Paul even includes himself in the list because Paul is so humble. And he says, look, you guys are picking which teacher, which pastor, which preacher to follow, and you're being divisive because of it. I'm sure that, that Cephas taught a little bit different than Apollos taught. And I'm sure Apollos taught a little bit different than Paul taught. And, and, and you know what? I can guarantee you that they believe different things because I've never met a human being on the world that believes exactly the same things that I believe. Like the, the fact of the matter is, is God is so massive, he is so infinite that it is going to be impossible for us to nail him down into a perfect little box. And because of that, we all believe slightly different things about who God is and how he works. And we teach slightly different things and we have slightly different theologies and that's okay. And yes, I think my theologies are right and I think others' theologies are wrong. Doesn't mean we have to be divided because of it. Amen? You guys following me? Yeah, in the First Corinthians church, there was division. There was division because of who they were following, who was, who was, who was being taught. Basically, what's, what's going on here is, is there's this church, this Corinthian church. It's a big church, thousands of members. And, and, and back in the day, because Jesus was kind of just recently crucified and, and just recently risen from the dead, and Christianity is just becoming a thing. It's only been a, uh, like 10, 15 years since all of this has happened. So one city would have one church. It would be the church of Corinth. And it would have different kind of bodies and congregations, but it would have the church of Corinth. And the reason why that was was because denominations haven't sprouted up and because division hadn't sprouted up. So there wasn't like the Methodists of, of, of Corinth and the Lutherans of Corinth and the Presbyterians of Corinth. There was none of that. It was just the Christians of Corinth. But Paul is starting to see division coming up. Because he's seeing, what, what he hears reported is that, you know, some people really like Apollos' preaching, and so it's not just that they like Apollos' preaching, but they're coming in and they're looking down and they're like, those people listen to Cephas. I don't, I don't want anything to do with them. We're going to sit over here. And the people who listen to Cephas, they're like, you know what? Why don't we start meeting on Tuesdays instead of Saturdays and not invite those guys who follow Paul? Because Cephas is way more handsome anyways, and I want to listen to him. And the people who follow Paul, I, well, Paul is like, he, he's this religious leader and he's so well, he's so well studied and, and Peter isn't studied like Paul is studied. Why would you follow Peter? And, and they start looking down and saying, I don't want to listen to any of that garbage that Peter's preaching because Paul is so much better. And everybody starts looking down on one another and they start being divided and they start fighting against each other. This is exactly what denominationalism does sometimes. Denominationalism causes us to be divided. What I find funny, and this is just a, a little bit pet peevey. So I, I always say that one day I'm going to write a book about Bible verses that, that some denominations or churches don't have in their Bibles. Because I think this is one of them. Because, uh, did you know, you guys have heard of Lutherans before, right? Praise God for Lutherans. I'm not attacking Lutherans. They have great, they have great uh, theology, man. They, they love the Lord. But you know why they're called Lutherans? Because they follow Martin Luther. Martin Luther was an old Catholic guy who started the Protestant Reformation by nailing 13 theses to a wall. It's all this history. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr., his name was changed to Martin Luther based off of the Martin Luther of, of, of history, of, of the Protestant history. So Martin Luther is this really big theologian, this really big pastor, and Lutherans are literally people who follow Luther. Right? You ever heard the term Calvinism? It's because there was a guy called Calvin and people follow his teachings. 
And then there's Armenian, Armenianism, which is the kind of the opposite of Calvinism. That's because there's people who, there is a guy named Arminius and people follow his teaching. Literally, people are saying, I follow Luther, I follow Calvin, I follow uh, Arminius. Uh, Methodists follow a guy named John Wesley. Praise God, John Wesley was a great saint. All of these guys, man, praise the Lord. They are great, mighty warriors. There's nothing wrong with them. But people start putting all of their pride, all of their loyalty in a person. And then because of that, they say, you know what? I, I, follow, I follow John Wesley. I don't follow Luther, so I'm not going to go to your church anymore. I'm going to start my own church over here. And so now we got Lutherans over here. We got Methodists over here. And then the Lutherans say, you know what? I think you're misinterpreting how Luther was teaching. And so I'm going to start a whole different Lutheran church. Now we got two different Lutheran denominations. And you got groups of people who say, you know, we're not going to follow one man. We're going to follow a Presbyterian, a group of people. They're called Presbyterian. And then the Presbyterians don't agree. So they start another group of Presbyterians. And all of a sudden, Christ's church is divided. And, and, and we meet in different buildings and we meet at different places and we preach and teach different things. And Paul is saying, what is this nonsense? Is Christ divided? Were you baptized in the name of Luther? Did, did John Wesley s- save you? Did, did Calvin die on the cross for you? No. Man, we are all Christians. We all belong to the same church. We should all be in this together. Christ did all of those things. Not Luther, not John Wesley, not Paul, not Apollos, not Cephas. It was Christ. So this is something that really perturbs me. As a pastor, I'm really bold when I talk to people that I just meet, like sometimes way too bold and I make people uncomfortable, like my neighbor. (laughs) Uh, but I'm really bold, man. I'm just jumping into it because I, I don't have time to like play the like touchy-feely like, oh, I'll see you on the side of the street for the next three years and then maybe I'll invite you. I, I don't have time for that as a pastor, right? Like I've got to build relationships quick because I want to teach people about Christ. And so I will just boldly ask people, man, what's your religion? Like, I'll say, are you religious? And if they say yes, I'll say, oh man, what are your, what's your religion? Dude, it perturbs me so much when people are like, Lutheran. What's your religion? I'm Lutheran. What's your religion? I'm Baptist. What? You're not Lutheran. You're not Baptist. That's a set of beliefs under which your religion is. You're a Christian. Why do you identify with Luther before you identify with Christ? That's insane. Side note to life. All right. Last pet peeve of the day. This is a big pet peeve, and I'm so sorry, guys. I love you so much. Can we stop using religion like it's a bad word? Please, church. I I know some of y'all do it. I've done it before too. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. I'm not religious. I have a, okay, hold on. Stop. The Bible never uses the word religion as a bad word. In fact, the Bible uses religion as a good word. Paul says that we need to practice good religion, and then he explains how to practice good religion. We have a religion. It's called Christianity. It's the only true religion. It's the only right religion, but it is a religion. That's okay. And, and sometimes we as Christians can be divisive when someone says, I'm religious, and we go, well, I have a relationship. Praise God, they're using a different word. It's okay. I don't need to use it as a bad word. Okay, sorry. Pet peeve over. Just, that's all. My point is this. Denominations in and of themselves are not sinful. They're not. But when we take pride in our denominations, we start to have problems. So let me just be real with y'all for a moment. Uh, Some denominations do things a little bit differently than we do things here. They teach things differently. They run service slightly different ways. And and the church looks a little bit different. And that's okay. Because these denominations, these churches that do things differently, that teach things differently, that act a little bit differently, they're still preaching the gospel. And we should praise God for that. We should praise God for that, man. People are getting saved in them. We should praise God for that. Y'all remember when we went to Lifeline, right? We'll just be real, all right? Just be real, real with y'all. It's a little bit uncomfortable at times for me. I'm sure it was uncomfortable for some other people because they do things differently, right? Like there was some stuff where I was like, what? What? He wants to line up in the middle and hold our ties over our, what? That's a little weird and, and worship is longer than we do and have a choir, and that's a, it was a little bit different, right? 
It's a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. It, it was run in a little bit different way. But you know what? That's why we go. So we can go and experience other things and worship with other believers and celebrate with them and say, you know what, sure, we do things a little bit differently, but that's okay because we're on the same team. We're worshiping the same God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, right? It's okay that they do things differently than us, right? Then no one's going to hell because of the way in which they run worship. No one's, I mean, I had to wear a suit. No one's going to hell because they had to wear a suit to preach in. That's not, it's not in scripture, right? In the same sense, no one's going to hell because they're preaching in jean shorts and a t-shirt, right? Like, people do different things for different reasons, different ways, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think it's good for us to find places where we feel comfortable to worship, right? If you feel comfortable going to a church that sings nothing but hymns and plays a pipe organ and the sermon is 10 minutes long, and dude, that's fine. Praise God. Like, we're on the same team. We're glorifying God together. We don't have to be divisive about that. And that's one thing that denominations are nice for in that we can say, you know what, I know that I like to worship this way and, so I, and I know that this denomination does it this way and so I choose to go there. That's great, praise the Lord. The problem is, is when we start to take pride in that and we start saying, well, my way's better and I would never go to that church because they don't wear suits when they preach. And I would never go to this church because they use instruments when they worship. And I'd never go to that church because a woman preached from the pulpit. And I'd never go to this church because they don't speak in tongues. And, and we start getting all proud, like we're better than them because, of, because our church is different, right? We get all proud. The, the fact of the matter is, I know most of y'all's stories. Most people here didn't choose to come to this church. Let me just be real with it, right? Most people didn't co choose to come to this church in the same way that we didn't choose to come to Cedar Rapids. We didn't look at Cedar Rapids and say, where's the best place we can start a church? And, and then we just spent years studying cities and we chose Cedar Rapids. That didn't happen, right? God told us to come to Cedar Rapids. In the same way, most people are, are here because God lined it up for you to be here. The vast majority of people, Mike, for instance, was Googling for a small church, found our church before our church was ever on Google. It was weird. Like, God just put the, church, the, the search result there for, for Mike and Des to come to our church. And so how silly it would be for us to assume that our church is better because it's God who brought us here. And, and there's a Methodist church across the street. God brings people there, too. I've got a pastor friend. He was here, Steve, uh, Steve Goodenough. Uh, he was here. He's Seventh-day Adventist. Dude, Seventh-day Adventists are weird. They believe some weird stuff. They do, but you know what? They love the Lord, and you know what's, what, what, Steve's, what Steve's testimony is? It's amazing. It's mind-blowing. He was a Pentecostal preacher. He was saved and, and, and preaching in, a, in an on-fire, charismatic, jump-for-joy, do cartwheels down the aisle kind of service kind of preacher, not Seventh-day Adventist at all, and God spoke to him and said, you're to leave your church and go join the Seventh-day Adventist church so that you can bring them back into fellowship with the body of Christ, and so he did. He said, fine. And he went and joined the Seventh-day Adventist church and they said, we're vegetarian. And he said, praise the Lord, I'm vegetarian now too. And they said, well, we meet on Saturdays. And he said, praise the Lord, we, I'll meet on Saturdays too. Doesn't matter. It's completely different than the way I, they say, you know, we don't speak in tongues. He says, fine, I won't speak in tongues from the pulpit. So we don't worship that way, fine. I'm not gonna worship that way anymore because I'm here to glorify God. And it doesn't matter if we do things differently. I'm willing to change in order to honor him. Man, can you imagine if that's how everyone in every church believed? If we're just like, dude, it's fine. We're going to do this. That's what I love about the, uh, the, the uh, night of worship and prayer that we do twice a year. Um, I, uh, I was at that service the, for the first time, and I was on a prayer team with a guy who, if you were in LIW class, you learned this word. He's a cessationalist. He believes that the gifts had stopped. He believes that they have ceased. He does not believe that you can speak in tongues. He does not believe you can pray for someone and they can be healed. Um, in fact, he adamantly doesn't believe these things. Like he would say those gifts are from the devil, right? And, and dude, that's weird. And the pride inside of me wants to argue him down. And how dare you believe that? Don't you know, how, how sinful are you? I can't believe people go to your church. If they only knew what our church was like, they'd come to my church instead. That's what I want to feel like. But praise God, we stood next to each other and we worshiped and we praised and we prayed for people and we raised our hands and, and, and we did things a little bit differently, but we're still on the same team and that's okay. No one's going to hell because they're a cessationalist. 
Their ride's going to be a little bit bumpier maybe, I don't know, but, but they're not going to hell because of that. They preach the gospel, and I praise God for that. How far do we take this, this concept of, of, of praising God for someone who believes something that you adamantly believe is wrong? How far do we take that concept? Paul takes the concept extremely far. Really, really far. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 18. Philippians chapter 1. So Paul, who planted the church in Corinth, who, who, who wrote 1 Corinthians, what we're going through, Paul is now in prison. He's been imprisoned for his faith. He's been imprisoned for being a Christian. He doesn't know if he's going to live. He's up in chains. Like, they're beating him. They're trying to kill him because he's a Christian. And now he's in prison, awaiting his fate in prison. And this is what he writes to the church in Philippi. Philippians 1, 14 through 18. Remember, he is in prison for being a Christian while he's writing this, suffering for God. And this is what he writes. He says, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Verse 15, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition and not sincerely or not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Just tell you what he's saying here if you missed it. Paul's in prison, and there's some people who are really like, like emboldened by him being in prison. And they're like, man, they're going to arrest Paul. Man, we're going to preach the gospel even harder. We're going to go at this and we're going to get some people saved. But there's others who see how successful Paul is and they're selfish and they're envious and they want to be as successful as Paul is. So they take his imprisonment and then on Sunday morning, they go and they start preaching their sermons and they go, see, I told you that Paul was sinful. That's why he's been arrested. And they see, I'm so much better than Paul because I'm here and he's in prison. And if, if Paul wasn't, was, it, was really a man of God, he wouldn't be in prison right now. And they preach Christ selfishly. And they preach it out of envy. They preach the gospel out of rivalry because they, are, they have a rivalry with Paul. And so he says, so Paul says, okay, they're preaching selfishly. They're preaching out of rivalry. They're preaching out of envy. And he says, you know what? Praise God because they're preaching. Praise God because they're preaching the gospel. Praise God because people are getting saved. Even though they're doing it out of, out of envy and out of rivalry, I will still praise the Lord. That's crazy. That's taking it way far. It's like this, just to bring it to modern times, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. You all know that there are churches out there, in fact, in whole denominations that believe everyone in this building is going to hell because we do not read from the King James Version, the authorized King James Version. This is true. In fact, there is a church in Cedar Rapids that I could guarantee you would say that we're all going to hell. If you talk to them, they would say, your pastor is of the devil unless he uses the, the 1911 or 1611 authorized King James Version. And if he doesn't use that, then he's of the devil and he's possessed. And your church, they're all going to burn. They would tell you this to your face. That's how adamantly believe, they believe this. But the fact is, even at those churches who are so hateful towards us, because we use different, different versions of the Bible, even so, they still preach the gospel. Even so, people still get saved in those churches. Even so, because of them, there are people who we are going to see in heaven. And because of that, we should praise God for them. That's how far we take unity. If a church is preaching the gospel of Christ, whether in pretense or in truth, whether out of envy or selfish ambition or rivalry, doesn't matter. We praise God because they're preaching the gospel. That's an insane amount of unity. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't feel comfortable. It goes against everything our flesh says. You mean you want me to praise God for someone who thinks I'm going to hell? Yep, because they're still leading people to Christ. And you know what? They might lead people to Christ who hate us. And that's okay. I still praise God for them because you know what? One day they'll be in heaven and they'll realize their error. And praise God, we'll still worship together. We'll still celebrate together. They'll find out they were wrong, right? And, and, and so we praise God for them. Man, we take this all the way up into the line until someone starts preaching a different gospel. That's when we draw the line. 
When someone starts preaching a different gospel than the one that is given to us in Scripture, that's where we draw the line and say, we have no fellowship with you. If they start saying there's multiple ways to heaven, if they start saying Jesus wasn't the Son of God, if they start saying uh, Jesus didn't die for our sins or he didn't rise again, if they start saying stuff like that, we draw the line. But Paul says if they're preaching the gospel, if they are preaching the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again, then we praise God for them. Y'all following me? And you know what I love about preaching out of Corinthians? I would have never come up on this subject on my own to preach about. I would have never preached about denominationalism. Not in a million years. But because Paul wrote it, and what I was talking to Amanda about is, I was like, I realized that, man, Paul was writing to a church. He was basically writing sermons to this church. And, and when I look at my sermons and I compare them to what the Bible talks about, like, it is not equally proportionate. I do not talk about the same things that Scripture talks about enough. And so I'm excited that we're going through Corinthians so that we can talk about this because truthfully, the world doesn't understand the difference between Lutherans and Methodists. What they see is division. What they see is two different religions. That's what they think it is. And when we start looking down our nose at other denominations, at other people, at other beliefs, they don't understand the difference between the King James Version and the NIV. They don't know what that is. All they see is two groups of people who hate each other and they think, I want nothing to do with that right? And we don't want that. Paul says, is Christ divided? Did did Apollos die for your sins? The problem with denominations is not that they're organizations, because organizations do great things for 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 the body of Christ nothing wrong with being organized. There's nothing wrong with having CEOs and boards and elders and and, and defined belief sets. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not the problem. The problem is not that they don't preach the gospel. They do, and thus we praise God for them. The problem is not even that many of them believe strongly different things than us. There are many denominations who do not believe that the Bible is the word of God, and that is a shame, and it breaks my heart, and I believe that it causes moral decay, but they still preach the gospel. And thus we praise God for them. The problem is not even that we are claiming to follow other people than Christ. This is what we need to gather. Paul was not saying it's a problem that you're saying you follow Apollos. It's a problem that you're saying you follow Paul. Or it's a problem that you're saying you follow Cephas. He's not saying that's the problem. The problem is is that because we follow someone else, we are using that as an excuse to be divided. In fact, Paul himself encourages us to follow him. Uh, He says in in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, 11 and 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with following Paul or following Cephas or following Apollos. It's when we use that as a means of division that it becomes a problem. The problem is, is that we as humans have so much pride and, 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 and we have so much pride in what we believe that we're divisive because of it. Dude, it's true. People take pride in their denominations. They take pride in being a follower of Luther, being a follower of Calvin or Wesley or Arminius. And the pride divides us and tears us apart. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction. 1 John 2 and 16, for all that is in this world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the, of, of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is of the world. Pride is icky. It's bad. It's gross. It's disgusting. We should want nothing to do with it. We are to have no pride in in, in ourselves, in our thoughts, in our beliefs, in the way we raise our children, in the way that we pick our churches. We are to be humble and accept that it is all because of Christ. And any good and perfect gift that comes our way is because of Christ. It's not because I raised my kids well. It's not because I brought them to the right school district. It's, It's because of Christ. It's not because my parents did the right things that I'm a Christian. It's because of Christ. We need to humble ourselves. It's not because of our church. It's not because of our preacher. It's not because of our beliefs, it's because we, we serve a loving, mighty, powerful God that we know Christ. Yet we walk around and we think things like, well, I follow Luther, so I'm a better Christian than you. What foolishness. We follow Christ. 
we choose to follow Christ. And we may say, you know what, I believe Luther's theologies over Wesley's theologies, and that's okay. Just, it doesn't make us any better than anyone else. It doesn't make us any worse. And we're all doing the same thing. We're all in it for the same, for the same reason. It's the same blood that covers all of our sins. I know I'm hitting the, hitting the kicking a dead horse at this point, but I, 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 want, I, I want us to get through our heads that just because we believe a certain way doesn't mean we're better. And every second that we think otherwise is a second that we need to repent and turn away from that thought. So I'll conclude with this. I want to take a look at our church in conclusion. We're what's called a non-denominational church. We're what's called a non-denominational church. Non-denominational means that we don't choose a specific denominational organization to follow or a specific set of beliefs that is presented by a denomination. We, we don't choose to follow those. Instead, what we do is we say, okay, we're going to follow the Bible and we're going to do our best to listen to what it says and we're going to read it and we're going to preach it and we're going to live it the best that we can. And me as a pastor, I answer to other non-denominational pastors. I'm not a part of a denomination. But again, church, hear me, that does not mean that we're better than denominations. It doesn't mean that we're better than the Lutherans or the Methodists or the Presbyterians. It just means that we're different. Y'all understand what I'm saying? It just means that we're different. And that's okay. <coughs> and we're simply Christian life, church. 1 Corinthians 1.12, each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas. Look at this last one that it says in 1 Corinthians 1.12. Each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And I always found it weird that Paul included, or I follow Christ, in that list. Because I was thinking, well, shouldn't they be saying, I follow Christ? Why are you saying that's bad? What? That doesn't seem to make sense in this list. And I was like, well, maybe he's saying that's the right thing, but that didn't really fit. And I started studying it, and I started reading it, and I realized that Paul was saying to the Corinthians, because he's talking about them being divisive, he was saying, there are some of you who look at the people who follow Paul, and look at the people who follow Apollos, and look at the people who follow Cephas, and you look down your nose at them and say, well, I don't follow any of those guys because I follow Christ. And Paul's saying that's nonsense too. Anything that we do to be divisive, any way that we look down on people, man, it's not okay. It's not. Man, and, and, and it's sad that we have to have non-denominational churches and Methodist churches and Presbyterian churches, and I understand the reason for them and, and, and all of that. And I, but, man, part of me just desires that church of Corinth, Right? Part of me just desires the church of Cedar Rapids. I, I wish that it was that simple. And that's why I love Serve the City and, and I love those nights of worships and prayers where we got 70 different churches and we got people who pray in tongues and people who don't even raise their hands in worship and, and they're worshiping together. And I look at those nights and I'm like, man, this is the church of Cedar Rapids right here, worshiping together, praising together. That's why we meet at churches like Lifeline, so that we can feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. So that we can realize it's not about us, it's not about our church, it's not about our pastor, it's not about our preaching or our teachings, it's about our Jesus. That's why we worship twice a year with 70 other churches. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, even though we're non-denominational, and I'm kind of talking down on denominations right now, and, and I hope you understand my heart is not that I dislike denominations, it's just the spirit of pride that we take in our denominations. But when we go and we meet with uh, Serve the City and this, this night of worship and prayer, the fact of the matter is, is almost all of those churches are denominational. Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists. And man, I praise God so much. I meet at Wendy's uh, once a week on Tuesdays with other pastors. Uh, one of them is a Methodist. One of them is from the Assemblies of God. Another one is a Presbyterian. Another one is a Baptist. And I'm non-denominational. And I praise God that those pastors are not non-denominational because they can help me in ways that I never even knew existed. Because they have went to different schools and they have different ways of studying. And when I come to them, man, they offer me such a full grasp of the gospel because I realize that, man, even though I'm doing the best I can, man, I've got a very narrow understanding of Scripture. I've got a very narrow understanding about how to run a church. And I praise God that there's other people with narrow understandings that are different than mine because that helps widen my understanding, amen? And, and that's what it's all about. So 
So church, this is what I'm asking today, man. This is it. We just, this, is, this is it. Can we just not look down on other Christians anymore? Can we make a pledge inside of our hearts to just be like, you know what? If someone else is following Christ. I'm not going to look down on them. Even if they believe something horribly different than what I believe. Even if they think I'm going to hell because of the way that I believe. Man, I'm not going to look down on them. I might converse with them. I might disagree with them. I might try to teach them some of my beliefs. But the last thing I'm going to do is look down on them and think that I'm better. Because we're not. The only one who's better is Jesus. That's it. The rest of us, man, the Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags. And, And the word for filthy rags is minstrel cloths. Wrap your mind around that. That's what the Bible says our righteousness is like. All of us. We got nothing. It's all Jesus. The Lutherans have the same Jesus we have. The Methodists have the same Jesus we have. The fundamental Baptists who think we're all going to hell, they have the same Jesus that we have. And we all have room to grow. And we all have things that we're wrong about. Man, if we can do it together, things are going to change for this city. Amen? Amen? Father, I thank you for this word. Lord, I thank you for just the spirit that, uh, of unity that is coming up. Lord, I thank you for pastors like Pastor Steve Goodenough who is willing to leave his denomination and join one that's crazy different for the glory of your kingdom. Father, I pray that our church would be known as a church not of weak values, not of, of weak th- thoughts or beliefs, but nonetheless that we are a church that is unifying. A church that, that, that loves our brothers and sisters in Christ. A church that understands that we're a family. Father, I pray for each and every heart inside of this room, Lord, that you would help us to understand the concept of humility and that we would seek it, that we would want it, and Lord, that we would never look down on another brother or sister in Christ again. Father, I ask that when people look at the members of this church, they see the love that we have for other Christians and they would know that we are followers of Christ because of it. Lord, I ask this all for your glory. Father, that people might be saved that your kingdom might grow, that your kingdom would come to earth, and and that, Father, that you would be able to send your son back and bring us home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Dude, that's a hard sermon. I'm sorry. uh, As as I look through Corinthians, I'm like, man, there's going to be some hard sermons. Next week I'm going to talk about how bad pastors are. So come back and enjoy that because that's what Paul talks about. It's the way it is, man. Whatever's in 1 Corinthians, that's what we're preaching about. And next week, he's talking about pastors. So I'm going to bring it about myself. It'll be fun. Y'all will enjoy it.